something that got in. I so think the question again. Hmm? The use what of contemplation question? on death, right? Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, other than coming coming down the mind, I mean the wandering thoughts, you know, cooling down the mind. Uh, what other aspect uh uh you think about this contemplation of death? Like what I, the people got it? Yeah. For me, I think it's more on uh letting go of um my clinging. Uh, mm. when I notice that I have certain kind of clinging, you know, sometimes it's clinging on, on even, uh, ill feelings toward others or you know certain things, mm -hmm. which is like bothering me a lot. So it's actually I'm clinging on those, those unpleasant mm. thoughts. So when I contemplate on death, uh, then these things become very small. Why should I cling on to it now? <laughs> Mm. Uh, okay. because when we are bothered by something it seems like we are putting all our attention on this thing it couldn't mm -hmm. it could have been not so big but we look at it as so huge mm -hmm. that's why we are not able to let go so mm -hmm. I will step one step back and see you know, contemplation on death so why cling on these small things make myself unhappy Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that means that uh, we can use it as an antidote yeah, mm -hmm. to our uh, what we call it, our craving or or our attachment to some ideas, you know, or something uh something attached. Yeah. So uh, Chia says, she says Chia says this is something new to you. Huh? have you watched this video anyway? <laughs> so Chia, do you watch this know. video? Huh? Actually, no. You didn't. Okay. <laughs> we should watch okay, it. Okay. It's a very nice story. Okay. Very nice story. One of our favorite story. So she kind of like this lady, we were girl, that uh, she she didn't know much about uh, Buddha's teaching. It just like by coincidence, uh, she passed by, you know, and then saw people uh, listening to the talk. She attended the talk. I think only two times, yeah, she attended to the to the teaching of the Buddha. And then uh, I think the Buddha purposely uh, gave the kind of teaching to her, seeing her potential uh, that uh, to be enlightened, and also she's going. She has a very short lifetime. Uh, the Buddha actually, even though the talk was given to the public, but he make it so that it's something special for her. And the topic that the Buddha cover is uh, impermanence, yeah, and also death. And she took it so dearly to herself. Uh, uh, after the second talk, uh, uh, she died in an accident. And she's a river uh, girl, right? That means uh, they make the, the track, right? With those spool, with a very sharp uh, needle, big sharp needle, the spooling uh, track. And she was hit by the spool and, uh, and killed. Yeah, But uh, the good thing about this story is she's actually a first stage of the centhood. Uh, there's a sotapanna uh, when the time when she died. So, uh, but anyway, the contemplation is is good in the sense that it's a contemplation of death. Penny, you mentioned just now, right? Yeah, it's a contemplation of death. Yeah, that, you know, uh, life is short. Yeah, I'm going to die one day. I could be die at young age. I could die in the middle age. I could die when I get old. Uh, so I don't know what time. There are a few uncertainties about death. One is, we do not know what time I'm going to die. When we are going to die? How are we going to die? Yeah. So by reflecting on this, uh, then when the time comes for us to die, uh, we can take it um, <laughs> or say comfortably, yeah, without having fear, yeah, or you know, or worries. Because we, we take it, it is it is nature. Everyone will die. Uh, easy to say so, uh. <laughs> But when it comes to us, especially our dear ones and our own death, I think it could be a different story. Yeah. And I think I still remember uh, when my, you know, this is also, uh, you know, the training as a Buddhist, uh, when we study the sutta, when we practice, uh, all this will come to us, uh, you know, naturally, the understanding. Yeah. And my when my father is dying, uh, she died in a month. Yeah, in a month after, 
was uh, confirmed the fourth stage pancreas cancer at the age of 18. Yeah. And my mom, so uh, the, the thing is because we, we, we didn't tell our mom. And then the father was so sick. Right. And the mom was saying that, what happened? What happened? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, my my brother brought my uh, my father to KL because she was so sick. So mother also come lah, and you know uh, I drove my ma I drove my mother to somewhere I can't remember exactly where, and my mother asked me to tell what happened uh, actually, <laughs> and I told her that I gave a simile, you know that you know uh just, just like this story. Yeah? So there is after after a storm, yeah, the next morning you look at the park. There are many leaves on the floor, right? Drop on the floor. Some are young leaves, some are middle, middle leaves, some are very old leaves, you know, already yellow. Yeah. But not all the yellow leaves, you know, some are green, very green, some are very small leaves. So uh, I said, uh, this is nature of life uh, after a storm. So I said, similarly, for human beings, yeah, some die young, some die middle age. Sometimes when uh sometimes when they are old age, and it is nature, and my mother got the message. Yeah, okay. So interesting experience when we company um uh, yeah, and we give our time, our service to our loved one uh, to accompany them in the process of dying. I think Sujin may also have a lot of uh, experience. Yeah, taking care of the mom. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, anyone else like to share about this uh, animation? Penny, <laughs> anything else that you want to say? Yeah, Like just now I said, no. So, uh, I think it's uh very good, lah. It's like uh, it's actually, I want it's like I I think into me it's like I need to reflect, lah. It's like the last two question, especially, uh, do I know when I will die? You know and do I is that do I do I know that I will die one day? Of course I know I know, but we don't reflect that. So and then the last question, do I know when I will die? So I don't know. But just now you mentioned even more better how I'm going to die, when I'm going to die, you know, all this even more better when? reflection. Yeah. When, how, especially how, you know. So I think uh, after I read this, right, when I reflect on death, uh, it always gives me a uh, like urgency to practice mindfulness every moment. You know, it's like not wait until you go retreat, not wait until you attend class. Every day also you can do some some samatha meditation or whatsoever. So it's to prepare your your death. La. When you reflect on death, uh, to me it's like at least you when you you let go, uh, it's like a lot of things you cannot control actually. It's like it's like with Pasana, I know, I mean, uh, Theravadian, uh, you go for rebirth, right? So you want to make sure good rebirth, right? But somehow when you see your thoughts, uh, very difficult to say where you are going, you know, you cannot control. So what you can do is only now, now you can do. And then at that time of death, it's just let it go lo, because you, I think you cannot, cannot control. I don't know whether you know what I mean or not. It's like you think you can control, but when fear struck, when uncertainty struck, when you cannot control struck you, right? Uh, individual, how strong is the mind? So I think what you can do is what I can do is practice mindfulness. It's like you aware every moment, aware every thoughts, and aware every feelings, and it's like that. You just let it flow. Uh. I I don't know. Am I correct? Not that, uh, but. Of course, like you say, you teach us uh, this class is to let us create the condition, make an aspiration to where we want to go. Of course, and during practice time, I'll do that. Lah. But during that bit, if you encounter pain, you know, those kind of pain, maybe you never encountered before or whatsoever happened, how, how steady you are, how mindful you are, how peaceful you are, you don't, I don't know. Lah. So mm -hmm. this is what I, I see lah, you know. Uh. Okay, uh, thank you, Fanny. Uh, I think this, uh, I have three points to conclude of what uh, a few of us have shared just now. But before that, yeah, uh, I just want to have one 
um, message that is uh, the Buddha taught many, many methods of meditation. Many, many methods. And in Visuddhimagga, there's a book, is um, The Path of Purification. This book was uh, compiled, I think, in the 6th century. Yeah, 6th century, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, putting aside this book, uh, this book mentioned about, um, I think, 40 types of meditation, or 40 objects of meditation taught in, in the book. It was one of the, I would say that it's the meditation manual that we can find. Yeah. And if in the sutta itself, I have attempted before, I was I compared how many types of meditation mentioned in the sutta. And uh, what do you think? Do you have a lucky guess? Is it like 40 of what the, the book Visiting Maga has mentioned? Or less than that or more than that? A lucky guess so that you can remember. How many do you think? How many types of meditation? So is this a chat? <laughs> How many types of meditation that the Buddha taught? Don't know. <laughs> Don't know. Just give me a number. At Maybe least more than 40. Like, could. More, more than 40. The, the, wow. uh, from the way wow. how you pass <laughs> more than 40. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this easy? Maybe about 4 to 5. 4 to 5 <laughs> methods. Okay. 4 to 5 methods. Okay. Okay. Don't be so greedy, I think. Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Jen? I have no idea. No idea. <laughs> Penny? Yeah. Lucky guess. You you say 40, right? So 40. No? <laughs> 40 is the one that uh, mentioned in the book, Visuddhi Manga, which is already about 5, 6, 7, 8. At least 800 years after the Buddha. That book uh, was compiled in Sri Lanka. All right. So in a sutta, my, my attempt was like, it's hundreds of meditation. Hundreds. So when I look at this number, but some are very really brief, you know, very, very brief. Uh, if you, if you, I can recall in the Dhammapada, eh, the stories of Dhammapada, there was this monk, the Buddha asked him to reflect on gold, G-O-L-D, gold. The reason in, in Pure's life, he was a gold man, right? And in this life, I think he must have tried a few kind of meditation method, but tajadi lah. Cannot very difficult to for him to practice. You know? So when the Buddha taught him to uh, contemplate on the goal, well, immediately, <laughs> not uh, long after that, he became Arahant. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is there are many methods taught by the Buddha. Yeah, and of course, we could not be too greedy, like everyone also, you know, every object that we, we also try to learn. Uh, it, it depends a lot on uh, the teachers that is available to us who can guide us. That is very important. And and uh, why are there so many methods? I I cannot really understand why are there so many methods. Maybe the, the, the Buddhas at the time, he, he thinks that as long as it works for this person, yeah, as a starting point, example, for the goal, asking this person to reflect on the goal doesn't mean that you know, this is the best object of meditation for everyone else. But that object of meditation fits for this person. Yeah. And because he loves go, he loves go. And then not only reflecting just on the solid goal itself, the Buddha also teach him that, you know, you have to also, uh, I think it's a visualization that the goal will be also not lasting, impermanent, because the only way to penetrate into, you know, into the arahanship that you have to get this idea of impermanence. Okay, so in short, I just want to conclude that there are many methods taught in, in, the, in the scriptures. Uh, we too speech is the one that available to us first. Yeah, and also we have this understanding. There are two kinds of meditation. One is a samatha. I mentioned to you contemplation of that is one of the samatha method. They might very quickly you can come down your mind, right? And the other part of it uh, is the vipassana meditation, which uh, the what the part that the, the main thing about this vipassana is you have to have a lot of uh, awareness, mindfulness within yourself, yeah. And of course, not just awareness itself. If you remember the four. Satipatthana, right? The first one is 
What is the first one? The four Satipatthana method. The body, Mind right? Mindfulness on the body. Yeah, contemplation of the body. Mindfulness of the body. So we say the body, including the breathing, right? From the body. The 32 uh, contemplation about the parts of the body, the hair, yeah, the skin, uh, the you know, the, the basically it's the parts of the body, uh, the uh, we call it what impurities of the body, yeah. And this is body, body a contemplation of the body. Uh, and Mahasi method, uh, Fanny, about the body, contemplation of the body, what is the method used? Uh, for the beginner, you use rising, falling, abdominal. Uh, but after that, uh, after a while, which is dominant to you? Mm. So the uh, the master method of the body contemplation is the rising and falling of the of the abdomen, right? That is the body contemplation. But it, just focusing on the rising and falling is a samatha. But we talk about vipassana, as you say, uh, it's not the only object, right? Is also the other object which is dominant, then we should also be aware, but not focusing on just one single object. Now, the so there are many methods, yeah. The body is one, okay. The second part of the pattern is feeling, feelings, feelings. Uh, feelings. So, feeling is also the object of meditation. I have one, uh, I always like to share this kind that. Uh, this this experience of mine, uh, that my my body was very itchy, super itchy until I cannot sleep. I cause I couldn't sleep for I think two nights. Yeah, I thought it's mosquito, you know, because itchy. You know. I thought it's mosquito, but uh, then I found it is not. Okay, so uh, because uh, why I found it is not because I put up the I have no choice. Uh, my house is already with mosquito netting at the window. And also the door. So I even put the netting, you know, uh, cover up my body, but still itchy, you know. Then I know that it is not mosquito anymore. So it could be uh, the elements of the body, lah. Huh? It's called itchiness. I don't know what is that. So that that night, you know, if I didn't sleep, I'm going to suffer the next day because I'm going to work. So what I did is that night I contemplate on the feelings. Now how I contemplate the feeling is. Uh, this feeling is impermanent. It's not me. It's not mine. It's not myself. Feelings is feelings. It's not me, not mine, not myself. Well, immediately I fall asleep. <laughs> I didn't even know that I slept, you know. Yeah. So because once I contemplate on that, that means I'm not attached to these feelings. Well, when I say I not attached, meaning that before that I was attached. Why? Oh, you itchy, ah, cannot sleep, <laughs> right? You start to have to be restless already. Itchy, itchy. Not only your body is itchy, you know, but your mind is also uh, start to itchy you now. Yeah, restless, angry, right? Upset that you cannot sleep. All these are mental suffering, right? So now, not only the body is suffering, but the mental is also suffering. So when we contemplate on the feelings, uh, satipatthana, yeah, then attachment drop. Okay, and there's no attachment. The mind is not agitated anymore. Not restless. Then you feel tired. Then you fall asleep. <laughs> I'm not telling you that you know you should practice uh, satipatthana so that you can have a good sleep. Huh? <laughs> so the first one is body. The second one is feelings. The third one is. The mind, right? The mind. And the fourth one is on the Dhamma. Yeah. The teaching. Yeah. Uh, some special teaching. One of it is like five aggregates. So we reflect on five aggregates. Uh, you know, the, it's non-self, impermanence. Okay. That is on the Dhamma. So I think we should continue with a topic here. <laughs> it's like going to study for Dhamma. All right. So I just want to get give you some idea that um there are many types of meditation methods taught by the Buddha, and I think there are three points about this contemplation of death related to the story about the river birth. One thing is uh, this meditation method, uh, contemplation of death, can help to calm down the mind. This is the first aspect. Sister. The second aspect, uh, I think Sujin already mentioned, 
that is um, is an antidote yeah, for restless mind, for attachment, etc. The third one, I think that uh, if one practice meditation on that, it will help to, uh, we call it um, contemplation of uh, the per perception. It is one kind of a meditation, we call it uh, contemplation of perception, or we call it meditation on perception. We, might, we train our mind to be uh, to have this understanding uh, death is something very nature. It's part of nature. Yeah. So when we train our mind, uh, the build a perception that uh, nothing is permanent, that everyone is going to die. When the death is approaching either to ourselves or to our loved ones, this understanding, the perception will come to us. Yeah, then it's very easy we can let go. So it will enhance our understanding. So especially if if you feel that you are even not a very confident person, you know, or you have a lot of fears, uh, this method I think will helps to uh, divert, yeah, you know, not divert to create the kind of understanding, yeah, <clears throat> or perceptions that it is something very natural. Then you will not have fear anymore. Okay, so it helps in building up our understanding. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get another thing about this understanding, but I cannot remember. It passed through my mind. I mean, okay, never mind. Leave it. Okay, come back. So um, we move on to the second, uh, the next sutta that is the Asipandaka Buddha Sutta. So this sutta is about um. Know, the a group of people who come to the Buddha and ask whether the the funeral rites, you know, when someone passed away, those funeral rites that they perform uh, is actually helpful or not for the departed one. Yeah. So the question uh, is, what do you think? What is the conclusion from the sutta? Can anyone share? Those who have read the sutta, those, who, the those yeah. who reborn in the he used the word what condition a good condi uh what condition correct something what condition he used right the word like, he is like uh, right, right condition, condition. Peta, la, in the ghost realm or something like that only will receive la. uh the funeral help the departed one who born there but the people who okay. do it will benefit from it also. The people who did it will benefit. Uh, sorry, can you can you summarize again, Penny? Uh, just the first one me. is if the they are born one, in a petal. Ah, uh, yes, mm -hmm. they will benefit from it. Your departed relative, la, or friend or whatsoever. Uh, 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 then the rest cannot receive. But for people who do it, uh, I, I remember la, okay, if not me, people who do it, people <laughs> will receive also good, good to ourselves also. Okay. Uh, Others, yeah. Hey, sorry, uh, I think this one is Janu Soni Sutta, is it? Departed one partakes our gift offering. Oh no, sorry, sorry, Sister Young. Uh, uh, I'm saying about Janu Soni Sutta. Oh, right okay. Yeah. They're quite so related. This one, yeah. this one, let me recall uh, because too many Sutta already. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've been giving you so many Sutta. Okay. Janu Soni. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think Janu Soni Sutta is the second one. Yeah, yeah, but I wrote it down because uh -huh. so long uh, I cannot read uh, again, <laughs> but I wrote it down, no, according mm -hmm. to the sutta, uh, mm -hmm. the funeral prayers help the part one know whether to be reborn in good or misery, misery uh, destination, it depends on the wholesome or unwholesome act he or she did in the past. I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> this one is I wrote down after I, mm -hmm. I read the sutta. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this sutta, Asibanda uh, Kaputa Sutta, the Putta means the sun, the sun Asibanda, Asibandaka. So it tells us that, uh, what do you call that? Um, let me open the sutta, uh, it'll be easier.
Okay, so he, uh, the Buddha was at Nalanda. Okay, and then um, there is a person who have destroyed life. I mean, killings, doing all, uh, you know, breaking the five precepts. Then uh, the what do you call it? The crowd of people will come, uh, sing and make prayers. Yeah, and saying that uh, this person will go to the heaven. Uh, putting aside that he did all sort of um, unwholesome actions uh, in his life by just doing the prayer itself. So he, the Buddha asked the people, will he be reborn in the heavenly world? And they say, no. Why? You know, just like uh, a huge boulder or rock that you put into the water. Sure, the, the rock uh, will sink into the water. Yeah, so someone who did bad things and then similar to like these rocks and you make prayers, this rock will not float, right? Similarly, if someone did a lot of unwholesome deeds in his life and you're making the prayers that he will be reborn in the heavenly world, it is unlikely to happen. Unlikely to happen. So one question in that sense, should we do prayers then? Huh? Should we make prayers? Uh, should we burn oops. the papers? Uh, should we burn the papers? Does it help? Yeah. In the car, the house. Something related to the, the next sutta is uh, not mentioned about paper, but mentioned about food. Okay, mentioned about food. Okay, we will come to the immediately the next sutta. But coming here, you reflect on it, knowing that whoever la, your loved one la, uh, you know, like so so la, never do good things la. <laughs> Probably a lot of lying, you know, or maybe uh adultery, uh, stealing. Do you want to do you think that you will still do prayer for him, funeral rites? You will still conduct funeral. We still have to, right? It's our responsibility <laughs> for our loved one. Don't care is whether it, it works or it won't uh, work. Uh, is is it more of our cultural practice, right? We mm. won't feel good if we don't do. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, my responsibility. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is according to Sigalo Wanda Sutta, right? Mm, when a right. loved one or parents pass away, you have to conduct a good uh, uh, funeral for them. It's our responsibility to make sure that, you know, they have a good funeral and then we share marriage with them and they pass away. It is our responsibility. You know? Don't think that after reading the Sutta, yeah, no use one, la, then don't do prayers. Don't do funeral, that cannot. Uh, I still remember one incident uh, that uh, one of my teachers told me, uh, a Buddhist teacher. So he says, he's a layman. Uh, he says, uh, no, he's, I think his brothers, brothers, uh, his family, a few siblings, uh, including the wife, the brother's wife, was murdered. Uh, this happened in KL, was murdered in a shop in KL. I think they stay in a shop. And then uh, being a Buddhist, now, of course, he did uh, a funeral rites for them. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure whether he is the only survivor in the family or not. And, uh, and after a while, but he didn't burn paper. He did not burn paper. And after a while, then he started to receive calls from his, uh, this auntie, that uncle. You know, oh, yeah, I have a dream. Uh. <laughs> they, they have no money. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> So everyone start to complain. You know? What he did is, okay, okay, okay. I'll choose a day. They all must come. Uh, I burn the paper in front of you. <laughs> okay, don't tell me that I didn't burn the paper. So it's, sometimes it's not for the dead one, but for those who survive. Uh, to give them consolence. Yeah, at least something, uh, you know, that paper money has been burned to them. And I remember one of the top in a chief saying, you Chinese are very clever. You invented paper money. You even invented credit card. Now, even what? Uh? I don't know. Uh, EV car? <laughs> paper EV car to the date one. So Chinese are very innovative, according to Chief Ram. All right, let's come back. So uh, this sutta yeah, that we know, that we learn, you know, more important uh, is what the, the person did yeah, in his life. Not so much of the on the funeral rites, but it is our responsibility, yeah, to take care and give them a good 
uh, funeral rites to our parents or grandparents when they pass away. And this is according to teaching in Sigamu Wanda Sutta. Okay? But as I say, but he tell us, uh, nothing much won't help much, <laughs> only their actions. Yeah. Okay. Actually, the next sutta is the uh, Janu Soni Sutta, right? So that is uh, the question that I gave is, can the departed one practice the gift yeah, that we offer through memorial service, especially in the seven month? Okay, now this sutta told us about uh, offering food. Eh? So, uh, I mean, just recall from what you have read to the sutta, and do you, uh, do you agree that the food will be consumed by the departed one? Penny, so the answer is, yeah, the sutta says uh, mentioned about the words right occasions. Uh. So right occasions means the departed one reborn in the sphere of afflicted mm -hmm. spirits. Mm -hmm. uh, so then they will benefit from it. Others, Ram, no. Uh. But then uh but then very one important thing he mentioned just now, like you say, we Chinese do it prayer out of responsibility, right? But mm -hmm. in this sutta, I think something beyond that. It's like he asked the Buddha if my departed relative is not born in the Peta uh -huh. or uh, yeah, then who benefited, you know? <laughs> then the Buddha actually said, You yeah. have been reborn so many times, uh, cannot be no one born in that realm. Mm. I, I remember. So it's like uh when we do it, maybe next time some family member pass away, you look it more in wider perspective. Like. Maybe your mm -hmm. relative only not this departed your father as your father or your mother as your mother. Many people be your mother or father mm -hmm. before already. You know, they are, they may be born in that realm. Uh. Yeah. There's a story in Dabapada uh, that I think is King uh, Ajasato's father is Bimisara, right? Okay. Bimisara. He 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 hear he hear the, the sound of the ghost, you know, haunted, uh, kind of haunted the palace. So we're asking, I've done so many uh, you know, charity, so many good deeds. How come I'm haunted, you know? And then he asked the Buddha. So oh, this is all your past, past life when you're uh, relative, you know, past, past, past life, you know. Uh, because in the past, you have done so much merit, you know, by uh, doing charity, offering food to the Sangha. And these are very much charities, but you never share with them. And they come after you because you didn't share the marriage with them. It's not because you did something bad, but because you did something good. They want to have a share of But this is a story uh, in Dhammapada. Uh, maybe for easy, is this something new to you that uh, actually food is allowable to offer to the departed one? Are you aware? Yes. Um, uh, this, you're aware? Yeah, every year, um, uh. Uh, you know, when we have this altar, uh, then they have this uh, uh the, the, the ghost month. Uh, every month without every year without fear, we were offering the food. Somewhere rather when the ancestor are sent to the temple already, uh, then mm -hmm. there's no longer offering in the, in that sense, uh, but there's still prayers going on. Uh. So does this uh um actually can help uh they say chow tu, uh. does it really help the the, the ancestor to chow tu? And chow tu means that there will be Blessing with more, um, I mean, more more goods in their next life. Um, I'm, mm. I'm just curious to understand, mm. and also, uh, I have been told stories uh, from my mom saying that, you know, sometimes even you chanting and whatsoever to shout up the departed one, uh, those people really require jing, uh, they'll come and hear like insects, you know, like flying out there. Uh, you wouldn't know, and these are part of them to get something so that they can come up from this realm. Mm. Uh, this is Mahayana Dilipa. So uh, I'm not sure how true it is true, but... <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay. I, I would like to hear from others also. Yeah, yeah. Su so Chien or Sister Chia, you have any uh, thoughts about it? Whether uh, Izzy is asking, does Chao Tu really help? You know what is Chao Tu, Sister Chia? I think this is freeze. <laughs> frozen. <laughs> yeah. Chia is frozen. Uh, so Jane, you have anything you want to share about okay, this? Okay, I, I have this, I mean, question that I asked. Um, the Eastern community tends to uh, offer food 
to the departed ones, uh, believing that uh, this food is necessary, then the only then the departed one can uh, be fed because they are hungry. Then I'm asking those people in the Western world, the way they conduct uh, their funeral, they don't offer food. So that means their departed one will go hungry. La. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> That's my thoughts in, in the mind. La. They go yeah, heaven. Yeah. heaven <laughs> uh, I, I also have heaven. the same thought like Sister Su Chen, uh, because my family, I my mom from a Christian background family, we don't offer food at home. So uh, I'm looking at this Suta like you say about food, la, okay? Um we we don't offer at all. So it's like if I don't practice this, but during Vasa month, I go to offer food to the monk. It means I do dana during this seven month. Or the Chinese say like uh, easy say you chow tu jian ting. Uh, or another way is uh you do you do uh fa hui uh, jian ting, all this uh. I I can practice that lah, but offer food, I don't have this habit. Lah. So is it okay, mm. no sister? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, even if I'm a monastic member, it's difficult for me to answer, uh, you should do this or you should not do this. Eh? But we try to understand from the sutta and our personal uh, point of view lah, huh? that I probably can help to give some answer. From this sutta, is already quite clear that offering the food uh, works. Okay, and but it works of course with some condition, uh, as you mentioned just now. For those spirits, yeah, who were born, uh, if our departed one born as a spirit, then the food I think they will consume, you know, it is the nutriment according to the Sutta. The Buddha said it is the nutriment. Yeah? But for if if our loved one, our parents, grandparents pass away, born in hell, and in the world, you know, then one, then this would won't work for them. Okay, only for those in the better the spirits world. Yeah, so one could, uh, this sutta, I mean, it's not my answer, it's, it's what this sutta says. So looking at this, uh, I just want to share with one encounter with, with my colleague. Uh. So uh, he, he's very young, young chap, and then he says, uh, you know, this seven month, uh, uh, I, I was thinking, my friend asked me to, to uh, offer food to the hang tai. Okay. You know, like Hengtai, la, those uh, departed ones, uh, not, not family members, but you know, outside, they call Hengtai, eh? those speak from the outside, they call Hengtai. Uh, then I said, you know, do you know that uh, for Chinese, I didn't talk in terms of uh, you know, religion, I talked about the, the Chinese culture. We, we pray to our ancestor, right? We offer food to the ancestor. I'm not sure whether you did that or not, but my family, we did uh, huh? all these uh, festivals. Including in the summer month, yeah, the Chinese New Year, we, we will offer food to ancestor. And uh this kind of offering, I told I told this colleague of mine, it is charity. Right? You offer, right? You, you don't you don't have to offer, but you offer out of compassion, out of charity, yeah, out of a uh, house on uh filler filler party, yeah, that to your own parents or to your grandparents that you offer this for. So it's a form of charity, I told him. But I asked him, do you do offering at home? Or not? No, I never did. My father trying to, uh, you know, ask me to do this, but I never. But when outside people ask you to do charity outside, you're willing, but your home put your charity, you don't want to do. <laughs> I, I asked him, is it the right thing to do or not? And then he started to ponder. It's a form of charity. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Whether the person, yeah, so you want to say something? The question is, uh, the departed relatives who benefit from our sharing of merits, dedication of merits, how do they uh, benefit? Do they benefit directly from the offering? That means they can consume the food that we offer or they benefit through because of our offering, they rejoice. Because of this rejoicing, they benefit. Because this rejoicing becomes a merit for them. Uh, mm. Yeah, so that is the mechanism which I'm wondering uh, which one is the one. Uh. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Probably we had to find out for the suttas. Uh. Yeah. That is, uh, yeah. well, this sutta, uh, the Buddha already mentioned, uh, you, you have your, you know, your other relative, past, past life, past, past, past life, who can be also beneficial. 
So uh, that's number one. Even if the direct one uh, which you offer uh, does not receive it, but probably others can, can receive. But something very important, I think it is, because there is uh, association, you know, there's a relationship with those who have departed. I think that relationship makes the difference. Yeah. So compare with like outsiders, uh, <laughs> Hing Tai, whatever, uh, that, uh, you know, which does not have any relationship with you directly. Okay. Now, I, I really cannot answer. I don't have this kind of psychic power to see, <laughs> to tell you whether it's true or it's untrue that uh, someone will actually receive the food. But I'm not sure whether you read one book by, by Bhante Agachita on this funeral rites, the offering to, the, uh, to those who departed. Have you read this book before, anyone? No. Uh, because he mentioned, in the book, he mentioned one lady which I knew her. I cannot remember her name. Uh, she has this kind of ability that she can see spirits. And this is what I read about her book last time. Uh, she has a book, but I cannot remember where I put it. Many, many years ago. Uh, she's a Melaka that I know. that uh, Because she, has, she can see spirits, right? So it was in the month of seven. She was in Malacca at that time, hometown. 4 p.m. And then she heard someone ring the bell. So take a look. That was her uncle who had passed away. So it's kind of like difficult for us to understand, right? Spirit. That's a doorbell. I couldn't get it. Yeah. But this is what happened. And that uncle who had passed away asked for permission. Uh, not only him, the other spirits who like to tumpang also at uh, car park, at their, their porch, asking for permission. Eh? And I think she can communicate. So she asked her mom, you know, of course, the master of the house. Lah. I was like, okay, they can come in. And they, can, they came in, you know. <laughs> yeah. And they also gave warning. So try not to, you know, to go to that area lah, because we all gathered there. Yeah. Sister uh, Young, is, I think yeah, I know yes. the, the, the one you mentioned because is I it? met her personally. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah. it, it seems like we need to invite also. Otherwise, our but, departed relatives cannot uh, enjoy the food. Cannot enter the house anymore. Uh, yeah. So you need to yeah. invite them. So that means if you uh. make the offering, there should be a, a mental invitation or, or physical mm. speech. Uh, that means invite them to partake only then they are able to receive uh, yeah I, I'm quite yeah. open to this I'm quite open yeah, to yeah. this this one okay. we are also uh, not sure uh, so anyway there are possibility mm. yeah people who have ability to experience and see for their own self well I don't have the kind of ability to be honest so I can't say yes or no but I'm open to this okay but I have one recent experience Okay, my my cousin brother passed away. Uh, 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 he has children, but he could stay alone, the children all overseas. And he died, uh, and then they found him dead is only a few days later. Okay, I think he, he had a fall in in the in the washroom. And uh, there's blood. And he died without anyone knowing because he's alone. Now. And knowing him, because I'm cousin, right? Not so close to him, but I know him personally. Uh, and I know his lifestyle and I know his character. Well, it's a pity. Uh, I didn't attend the funeral, but anyway, uh, the, the family members, we donated some money yeah, to, for, for his uh, service, big service. Now what happened is, a few days later, I slept and then Suddenly, I have this awareness uh, in the sleep. Uh, I have this awareness. I don't really know whether it's a dream or not, but I am aware that uh, I heard the sound of chain, you know, cling, 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 chain. Someone with hands and running around on top of me. Yeah, so I do prayers. No, it's such a pity, you know. This being is being chased with a chain on him. I'm not sure whether it's, it's him or not. I really do not know. I start prayer, mm. chanting, la. 
with giving with the intention of helping him to relieve from the suffering. That last one, I don't wait one minute or so, then the sound disappear. Okay, so this is something where uh, yeah, I really do not know whether yes or no kind of thing, you know, whether the funeral rites help, but somehow I, I personally believe that it helps. Personal, my personal feeling, it, it helps. Yeah, uh, another incident, uh, quite some years back, I became a hospice volunteer already. Then one another cousin also happened that this is another cousin brother, which is the direct brother of this cousin brother who just passed away. Now, so this is this uh, cousin brother, some years back, he died again, single. He died in the hospital. When I mean, the time that my mother, he, before he died, his death, my mother, uh, you know, I checked my mom. My mom said, oh, no, he's not in the hospital. Uh, it's it's uh, very risky already. So I went back to my hometown just to pay him a visit. I went to the hospital. He's already unconscious with many tubes uh, within his body. And, you know, uh, I'm not sure whether he can hear me or not because he's unconscious. So I hold his hand. Eh? Just as hospice volunteer, volunteer we are told we can slightly, you know, hold the patient's hand if we know this person. Then I told him, you know, when I was when we are young, I remember our grandmother uh, is a Kuan Yin disciple. I know you are in pain now. So why don't you pray to Kuan Yin? That's the first thing. Yeah, just like our, what our grandmother did. And secondly, you say, I'm a Buddhist. You know? I took refuge in the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha and also five precepts. Now, I will chant this for you. Now, if you like, I say, you know, if you like, I say it out, if you like, you can follow my chanting and become a Buddhist. So as a lay person, eh, so I chanted the Sarana, the five precepts. And then I shared the merits. That was Saturday. Eh? Then I quickly I had to come back to KL again. Now on Monday morning that I received a message from my brother that uh, that he has passed away, this uh, cousin brother. And that night, Monday night, my family members, my siblings in hometown, eh, they, they, they had a short meeting uh, to decide how much that they should contribute for his week service. Because he's, he's alone, he's a single, and parents already passed away. Okay, so some, need someone to, to, to help out for the week. So decided how much. Now, that night, after the meeting, my elder sister went to the kitchen and he saw my cousin brother in the kitchen. And Seeing is one thing. The second thing is, he said the whole body is bright, shining, shining body. So my other sister called me and I told her, don't be afraid. You just want to come and say, thank you. Okay. So I was thinking on it. Saying, uh, because uh, being reborn with, uh, say, a spirit, very shining body, uh, it's a good sign, isn't it? Looks like it's a good sign. Not in a pet tower, you know, any uh, awkward look. Anyway, it's a, it's a good sign. I was thinking, I know this uh, cousin brother, you know, I think he didn't do much in his life. If he can be reborn in such a good state, you know, what are the conditions? Uh? Is it because of the chanting? He said, if because of chanting, I'm a lay person. I just do Taking refuge, five precepts only, you know. What more if I'm a monastic member? A monk or not? So can you see the point? I say, I think it helps. You see the point or not? I hope it makes sense to you. Yeah. Sister so, Yong, mm. I know what you want to pass the message to us. It's like, even just a simple one, it helps a lot lah. Yes. But sometimes whether you are a lay person, you didn't do a lot, or you are in monastic, you did a lot. I find it um intention mm -hmm. is very important. Mm -hmm. So I might be a lay person, don't know about Buddhism, but I do not much, but a lot of time my intention is pure. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So I might be doing a lot, but my intention actually a lot of greed, hatred, and delusion. So mm -hmm. I I look at this way like that. Sometimes I 
thinking thinking about this, having th this thought, right? Uh, of course, there are unpleasant feelings arises. There are fear because mm -hmm. uh, seeing that uh, there are so much defilements where I cannot get rid. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, th this is what I want to share with you. Lah. Sometimes I see some people may not do a lot, but mm -hmm. maybe their intention is very pure. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Understand, understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what in my mind, lah, whenever we come start to look at things like that. But I'm very sure it's like when you say even just a little chanting helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one I'm very sure that one. Can I put it in that way? It's more of uh, the quality of the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of the mind of that person. You know, probably the chanting helps him to have a, a good quality of mind, which is more peaceful, more at peace, uh, no worries. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that helps him to have better rebirth. Mm -hmm. and, and we cannot... You cannot control the mind of the, mm. the person who are dying, yeah, right? We can't control. Yeah. But our own, and say the karma itself, our own actions, our own mind, with compassion, with loving kindness, with understanding, yeah, about uh, the karma and the uh, rebirth. I think that will help. Yeah. I believe that will help. So, I I have a thought that so you know, maybe the Guan Yin help la, because Guan Yin in me very important. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah. I but I, if it's yeah. if it's not if 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 someone did not initiate, you know, that kind yeah. of uh, association, uh, yes, say with the Guan Yin or with compassion, for example, it will not happen. Yeah. You, yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah. have one one very special experience, but you know, time. Not enough. I, I will not. Sh I will not do it long, but uh, you know, some of this personal experience uh, is very difficult to share because you've gone through it and uh, you know, you know, but when you say to others, very difficult for them to to believe. What more is in a sutta? People already don't believe. What more your own personal experience? Yeah. So uh, anyway, it is my personal opi opinions that the ceremony is. Does help. Just one more sharing of my personal experience. Uh. There's one of these so called Chaotu, right? Is it mentioned Chaotu? Uh, because my parents are very Chinese based, you know, Theravada, they are doing Pali chanting. And I, I still feel that, you know, the, the Chinese culture will be more uh, closer to them. So I don't mind to enroll, my, uh, you know, for Chaotu for my parents or my grandparents. If my sisters, my, my siblings wanted to do that for my parents, I always uh, be supportive, right? And one of it, one of the rituals that I attended yeah, for my ancestors lah, at the temple, my temple, because they in the summer month especially they will offer uh food you know including dry food, rice, dry rice, not uncooked rice, yeah, biscuits, or fruits, and cooked food also, but uh. In the hall, the one because there are too many people, the hall that I was in, uh, mainly dry dry food, yeah, rice. And in the middle of the chanting, when I look into the food, suddenly I have slivers, you know, in my mouth. I was thinking, this is only rice, dry rice, you know. Because, you know, why am I having this kind of uh, one thing to eat? Uh? I reflect on it. Then I said, hey, this is great. Praying for food, right? Praying for food. So I said, okay, this is food. And this is greed. I should look into my greed. You know, if not, if we didn't get rid of this greed, it will bring us to the spirit world and to the hell. Do we want to be like that? Always praying for food? I reflect onto it uh, within myself. Do I want to pray for food? Then my slide will stop. Because I don't want to be go into that stage Whereby in the next life, for example, I could be in a hungry ghost or in the spirit world or in a hell. It's just starving for food. Just like a sliver coming in, uh, seeing food that I'm praying for it already. Now, after I gone back, right, I reflect on it. That kind of one thing to eat, uh, because dry rice wall, biscuit wall. You know, is it my own feelings that I have this kind of craving? 
in my past life, maybe I was a hungry ghost before or in the hell, that when someone do that kind of offering to me, I was, wow, I was so overwhelmed, you know, and I crave for that. It could be my past experience, I wouldn't know. Now, the second part is, it could be my association with my ancestor. They are there, they crave for the food. Somehow because there's association with me, uh, I feel craving for food also, I wouldn't know. But luckily, I reflect on it, right? This is greed, this is craving. This will bring it to this stage of life. Spirit world, what the hell? I hope it makes sense to you. Okay? Uh, I'm not sure whether my experience is should be interpreted in such a way, but this is how I deal with it. Yeah. So I'm quite open to talk to, as long as it's according to Buddhism principles. No killing. Uh, to me, vegetarian is fine. No problem. Food is okay. We have this sutta. We have no the Devana Sutta. You can offer food. It's not a problem. Yeah. And and as what this sutta says, the the offering of food uh, was somehow if if none of your ancestors are in the spirit world, the offering itself, the charity itself, is already a good deed. Charity. This is charity. Yeah. Just reflect on that. Even if you give charity to bogus monks, is it good karma? It's good karma because you have good intention that you see someone who needs food. Even if he's bogus and you offer the food and you help him. Compassion. Yeah. Love and kindness is there. And the action of doing charity is there. So it is definitely something beneficial. Doesn't matter whether he receive it or not, whether this person is a bad person or not. And you know that the act of giving, the right way that is, uh, I mean, not the right way, you're offering food, right? Food, which will help him to, uh, when he's starving. There's nothing wrong. Okay? So, yeah, so I hope you get the message from this hotel. Doing charity is good. But what the Buddha say, I'm not sure whether I put it in the next slide. Yeah, let's go through it. Huh? This sutta he says, if one performs unskillful actions, yeah, uh, this is, I think, the, the end of the sutta that the Buddha made this message. If one performs unskillful actions, that means he kills, he steals, adultery, lying, etc., you know, but he gives to charity, okay, including food, drink, vehicle, driving, uh, dealings, um, etc. He is reborn in animal realm because of the bad actions. But because he performed charity in the animal realm, say as an elephant, for example, he gained, he had food, drink, and other benefits as an elephant. Why? Because of charity. Yeah. And if one performs skillful actions, good actions, and he gives a charity, wow, for sure, he's reborn in human world, yeah, and he gains food, drink, and other benefits in a human world or in a divine world. So don't look down at charity. Even if you give to a bogus monk, you will have the benefits also. Yeah. So the charity, the act of charity, is not fruitless. So I can't remember which sutta the Buddha say. If you know the benefits, the benefits of charity, you always want to give. If you know the benefits, yeah. So the next sutta is Samana Pala Sutta. Yeah, I know we are running out of time. Mr. Yong, sorry, Chok. Huh? Do you mm. any sutta like talk about the the benefit? Just now you mentioned the benefit of charity. Any sutta? Oh, there are many. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Next time you can for... have. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I'll try to look for a few. I think one of the DIG could be two years ago eh, that um, organized by, by the Sam. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, the emphasis is on merits and the dana, 
So I think there must be a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, I'm trying to ask them similar they have any compiled slides. I believe he will compile many slides based on the sutta, encouraging maybe, people. Mm. Maybe not sutta, maybe like you say, there are so many, right? Any talks uh, that compile everything. <laughs> So that yeah. we have the summarized one. Summary. Uh, that's what I'm saying about this, but the yeah. same. Uh, uh, okay. uh, two years ago, the IG, I think that because they have a series of talk on on uh, Dana, on the merits, and he is very much into that. <laughs> yeah, and now uh, the all the Arya events, yeah, Vesa, uh, what do you call that? Uh, those party Dana events, uh, lunch or dinner. But it, will, it will help these events at his place in TDDI. Uh, we call it a candy day. For, uh, for I think five star, five star hall event. Free your charge for us. He's been doing a lot of charity. And he understands clearly uh, what are the benefits benefits of doing Dana and Metroids. Okay. Uh, I will try to look for it and send you it on. The Samana Palasutta, this is in uh, Dikarikaya. I just uh, you know highlight one part of the sutta for us to to read, right? Page 52 to 60. Let me open the sutta here. Yeah. Sister Cha and Izzy, if you have any question, can ask. Huh? So far, okay. <laughs> okay, 52. Uh, here I mark right. So um, this Samana Pala Sutta, I just want to give an introduction. It's also quite a long sutta. That um, talking about uh, you know, this King Ajatasatu that are uh, asking the Buddha, he said the other teachers uh, in other religion, you know, that he he met the teachers that he met, he asked them this question: What are the fruits of being an ascetic? being a samana, what are the results, uh, so-called results that you can obtain of uh, being an ascetic you know, in your religion? This is his question. And he is unhappy because uh, these teachers gave him very ambiguous answers. He's not happy with the answers. That's why he came to the Buddha. And, uh, you know, he said, this teacher say this, and that teacher say that, and the Buddha gave some, uh, you know, some suggestions, some suggestions to him. So I just summarize. I know the sutta is long. I summarize here. You know, for us to understand eh, that there are other school of thought with different kind of idea about these actions or karma. The Purana Kasyapa, the six teachers here, we call it the six famous teachers, which is contemporary to the Buddha. That means during the Buddha's time, they're already there. So uh, Purana Kasyapa denies any good or bad actions. Any actions that we did is nothing good and nothing bad. So if someone commits killing, and burglary, adultery, lying, it's not evil. If someone performs charity, there's no merits. So it was kind of like, uh, we call it the amoralism today. Yeah? That means this school of thought uh, they are. They don't talk about moral. Do you know any uh, belief system today who are having this kind of thought, this kind of philosophy? Anyone encountered before? Chia? No. Okay. Uh, what happened is uh, yesterday I attended one event by another religion. Uh, yeah, it's a groundbreaking of one religion group. So I went. And uh, the this uh, uh, this school of thought uh, or this particular sect is uh, is new to me, so I went to the site and I looked for some basic information and I found something which is quite close to this kind of idea, but not totally, uh, but very close to this kind of idea. Uh, in the website, this school of thought says. We can never make up for our sin by self-improvement or good works. Meaning that they do not believe charity, right? 
They know their sins, of course, you know, uh, they define their own way of sins or reparations uh, from, the, uh, from the sin. Cannot be done through good work or self-improvement. So I just wonder, for this religious group, uh, will they do charity or not? I do not know. But they are all very happy looking, you know. Their members are all very happy looking. But I ask, I have this question. Will they do charity? Yeah? Maybe not. Yeah. If they do charity, then out of what reason that they do charity? Maybe just for, what do you call that? Humanity? Because they don't believe that this will help. Yeah. Oh, humanity probably they will help others, but not. But they don't think by helping others, you know, it is good karma or good actions. Okay, and they are one of their strong supporter, uh, is you know one of the rich men in in Clan Valley la. So interesting to find out they deny good actions. Yeah. So they trust that only by you know. The uh their belief system, who they believe in, uh, by entrusting this their belief system, only then they can be saved from sins, from that eternal life. Not through their hard work, their good work, but through the faith uh, they have with their religious uh, system. So somehow similar, right? Somehow similar, not completely. Okay, the other uh, school of thought, yeah, Makali Gosala. Fixed karma. Everything is past karma. Everything is fixed. Right? It's already predetermined. You cannot change. No chance to change. Whatever mentioned, it will happen. Uh, whatever determined, it will happen. So uh, the Buddha questioned this kind of religious thought a lot, uh, with the idea that if this is what you say, then why do you become ascetic? Because there's no way you'll become enlightened, you know? Everything is determined. There's no chance for enlightenment. So this is uh, one question to this religious teacher, where they said everything is a fixed karma, past karma. Okay, Ajita Kesa Kumbari. They believe that upon that, everything is annihilated. Human beings are only four elements. Earth, water, heat, and wind. That means when one die, every nothing left. Nothing left. Then again, I ask the question: Why do you practice that uh, if nothing left? Why do you become ascetic? <laughs> for what? Since nothing left, you know, you become ascetic for what? Very strange, uh, contradictory. And these are uh, they call it materialism. Yeah, there's no uh, mental factor here after one passed away. Earth go to earth, water go to water, heat and wind, that's it. Nothing left. Yeah? Materialism. Pakuda Kachayana. There are seven eternal elements. Now, this is a bit uh, complicated. Uh, seven elements. Okay? Their elements do not interact with one another. Now, one of the elements is actually pain and life. I don't know why pain, one called feelings, is one element. What about happiness? It's not mentioned here. And life. Strange, I did not study yeah, in, in depth about this region, but they call themselves externalism. Sorry, not external. Eternalism. It means eternal. These are all eternal, you know. I, I don't quite uh, understand what this is. I'm sorry. But to them, not external, sorry, this is eternal. I will make uh, changes later on. That means after life, everything will be back to earth, water, fire, and these are all permanent. Even life is permanent. So I suggest maybe they also have something like a soul. I'm not sure about why they talk about pain. I'm not sure. Yeah. But this is the school of thought. Yeah. Nikanta Nataputa, which today uh, we, name, we call them Jain, Jainism. Uh, this sutta does not give a lot of details about uh, Nikanta Nataputa, but the next sutta did. Yeah? Uh, they are naked. Yeah? They are uh, practitioners, especially the serious practitioners, they are naked. They practice austerity a lot, uh, especially when they are naked, right? Uh, during the summer, they will be standing under the sun the whole day, 
under the sun. It's one kind of uh, austerity uh, to them. And they believe that by doing this uh, austerity practice will cleanse their bad karma, right? And they'll become pure yeah, by practicing austerity. This is called Jain. They are quite an old religion, uh, earlier than Buddhism. Jain. Sanjaya Belataputta. So this school of thought is really tricky. If are then, is it so? Uh, I don't think so. Or, uh, you know, I don't think, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think not or not, not. So uh, they are like an ill, uh, e, uh, I mean, E-E-L, ill, is, uh, you know, very smooth, you cannot catch them. They will not give you a definite answer, whether yes or no, okay? So these are different school of thought, yeah, during the Buddha's time. So I just mentioned one that uh, very similar to this uh, school of thought, denies any good or bad, but they give they believe in something eternal according to their religion, but not life, pain, air pressure, but this uh, creator God. Yeah. Uh, let's come to the last sutta, the Devadaha Sutta. I won't go in detail about this sutta, yeah. Point six. Yong, I find the language used in this yeah. uh, very public. <laughs> <laughs> you, like, you can look for other you know, alternative of the sutta. One, I think good one could be uh Venerable Sujato, yeah, from Sutta Centra. But uh okay, I find it I know that it's difficult to read, but I, I find something interesting which I want to share, yeah. Um, So uh, I just come to these few points here. Yeah? So the the this is what the Buddha say. Yeah? He told the bhikkhus. Uh, he told the monks. So if you go to the Nikanta, the Jains. Yeah? So what do you think uh, the Nikantas? Yeah, the Buddha asked, what do you think Nikantas? Because they are practicing austerity. So uh, the Buddha asked, when there is intense exertion, means that uh, very intense, very severe uh, austerity. Yeah. Yeah. Do you then feel painful, wrecking, piercing feelings due to this intense exertion of austerity? Okay. But when there's no intense uh, exertion, that means that they're, they're not practicing austerity at the time, do you then feel painful, wrecking, piercing feelings due to this austerity? So they say, yeah, the, the, the Kanta people say, the Jain said, when there is intense exertions, yeah. They will feel painful. Yeah, they will feel painful. But if there's no intense uh, striving, no intense exertion, they do not feel any painful feeling. So the Buddha then say, in that case, uh, you say, you know, because now, now you practice austerity, you feel you feel very painful, yeah, you feel very distressed. If you don't practice austerity now, then you feel very uh, comfortable. Then it means that your feelings is not from your past life, right? It is now. Yeah, now what are you doing now? Is making how you feel. Not everything due to past. Uh, this is one of the answers given. Eh? So, so it's not fitting for the Nikanta to declare that whatever the person feels, whether pleasure or pain, yeah, or neutral feeling, is what caused by what you've done in the past. In the present, what you did now is already affecting how you feel, not only from the past. This is what the Buddha is trying to point out. Yeah? If you say everything is due to past, this is not the case. Yeah? There's another point. Okay. One, uh. I'll skip this.
This is for Buddhist practice. Huh? The Buddha is explanation. Okay. How is exertion fruitless? Because how is striving fruitful? That means that if you practice faithfully yeah, with austerity, austerity also uh, in Buddhist context, is it fruitful? Yeah? Is there any benefit or not? Because yeah, if it's not overwhelmed by suffering, if the practice of austerity yeah, is not a lot of suffering, yeah, and it does not create uh, oneself uh, with uh, you know, feeling un of uncomfortable, then also not giving up the pleasure according to the Dhamma. That means that you still have some pleasure according to the Dhamma. I mean, you still have your life, comfortable life, according to the Dhamma. You are not, uh, you practice austerity, not until the, that you torture yourself, you have a lot of suffering. Okay, this is allowable. Yeah. So in Buddhist itself, uh, austerity is uh, allowable as long as it is not too extreme. Okay, not too extreme. In, in other words, it has to be middle way. Yeah, not too much of pressure and not creating suffering, then it is allowable. Yeah, if you compare with those austerity practiced by Jane, for example. So he's trying to give some example. Now I bring this up is like because the Jane is thinking that uh, cleansing oneself bad karma by practicing very severe austerity. So in Buddhism, do we do that? Yeah. So Jane, you have a question? Yeah, I think looking back at the Buddha's time, uh, this Mahakasapa, he is he the one who actually practiced more austerity as compared yes. to the normal Sangha community? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, talking about the uh, cleansing the bad karma, do we practice it in the Buddhist community or not? What do you think? Do we do that in Buddhist community? Cleansing the bad karma. The Xiao Zai Yan So, even the name already <laughs> yeah. is, has this connotation. Yeah. And does it work? But I still think, even though Xiao Zai Yan So, right, it's still like the simile talking about the salt in the river and in the cup. I still think so. La. If really mm. you talk about karma, la, it's because you continue to do more good. Yeah. And, and then, I, I thought. Yeah, and I told you I participate in some of the so-called the rites, right, for departed one, like this kind of a uh, you know, seven month, especially for the Xiao Zai Yan So. Yeah, and, and, and when I do the chanting, right, actually the chanting is more meaningful. <laughs> it tells us, you know, uh, I, I still, I'm trying to recall, uh, you know, because of this killing, this kind of killing, and because of this kind of craving, and, and, and lying, right? And uh, all these sort of bad actions are causing one to be reborn. Now I regret and I repent. I shall not do it again. And so, as I seek yeah, the, uh, the refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and I do not want to delve again into this kind of uh, actions that causing me more suffering. Yeah. Kind of like, you know, uh, I surrendering myself from all these bad actions, and I know very well these bad actions is creating this kind of suffering for me. Therefore, I repent, and therefore I ask for forgiveness, and I make a promise I'll be a good person. I think it works, right? <laughs> it works. So to me, no problem. Uh, it works. And, uh, and it works. And if the departed one, because association, you know, the 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 closeness with with me, uh, the family members, and if they come and listen to the teaching and they do the chanting, I think they will learn something. To me, like, before they learn, I already learned from the sutta. <laughs> and I find it, you know, a lot of time, I find it very kantong, you know, when I read through the sutta. Yeah. And I remind myself, yeah, I shouldn't have that. I, should, I shouldn't do this. Yeah. So I think reflection uh, within myself is also important when we perform this kind of rituals. Don't think that the riches is for others. Uh. It's also for us to reflect. Yeah. And, and I think this is a good one. Uh, let me go through this before I do the conclusion. Uh, uh, 
yeah, the this this passage uh, by the Buddha. Yeah, suppose because sorry, uh, a man loves a woman with the mind bound to her by intense desire and passion. He might see the woman standing with another man. So that means he, he loved a woman uh, and the and the woman was with another man, joking, chatting, laughing. So Biku. So would would the would you yeah feel painful grief despair because you know the woman is with another man? And the monk very honestly say yes, yeah. Uh, why? Because the man loves the woman, and his mind bound to her by intense desire and passion. Yeah. So that's why he feels sorrow, lamentation, pain, and grief. Yeah. Then he say you know uh, if. Uh, if the if the man think that you know, I love this woman with my mind bound to her by intense desire and passion, because of that sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair arise in me. When I see her standing with another man, okay, what if I were to abandon my desire and last for that man and the woman? He would abandon his desire and last for that woman. So on a later occasion. When he might see the woman standing with another man, so he asked him because uh, would sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair arrive in the man? They said no, sir. Why? Because the man does no longer love the woman. Yeah? So because he does not love the woman, there's no sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief. Okay. So so when a bhikkhu is not overwhelmed by suffering, does not overwhelm himself with suffering, yeah. The suffering is associated in him. He can do this because there's no more lust and desire. So that plays a very important role. Yeah. In terms of uh what we call that getting rid of the bad karma or not creating fresh karma if he can do that. So anyway, I close the discussion about this sutta. I have another uh, what do you call that? Uh, conclusion uh, on from the last few session, yeah. I could have this from the young. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. a question. Uh. Yes, I have a Penny. question on the 23rd, right? Uh, because 23rd I realized paragraph? some yeah, 23rd, yeah. It's about the pleasure that accords with Dharma. Yeah, yeah, because I know when you sit meditation, pain uh -huh. is something good. Mm. Well, it helps you to concentrate, but somehow when life is too difficult, sometimes we have some entertainment or whatever, right? Mm. It, like you say about middle path, uh, maybe because sometimes I cannot find the balance about it, right? So i really curious about pleasure that accords with Dharma. Mm. I, I will explain in uh, two different levels, uh, Penny. Uh, one level is for the lay people. Okay. We are lay people. So we are allowed to enjoy Okay, uh, the five senses to the five senses, uh, good food, good music, entertainment, as long as it's within the principles of the five percepts. I'm not hurting someone else, I'm not doing any adultery, I'm not stealing, I'm not killing. Uh, that is fine, uh, that is for the lay people. But this particular paragraph is to the vehicles. Yeah. You still can and have your enjoyment in uh with the Vinaya. Okay. It's like uh you know, you know that Vinaya that you are not supposed to wear Rolex, you're not supposed to listen to music. Uh what I mean is the entertaining music. Yeah. Soothing music, I think, should be okay, but street monks say no, okay. Uh you're not supposed to listen to music, so you're not supposed to sing. This is according to the, the monk's opinion precepts, yeah? And uh, of course, beyond that, these are all through the five senses. But if uh, one experience um, joy in meditation and in studying the Dhamma, you know, reflecting on the Dhamma, uh, contemplating on the Dhamma, uh, joy arises, that is okay. Yeah? But they must be aware, I try to recall, I'm not sure whether you re re do you have this book called like Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, in the Buddha's word. Do you have this book? Okay, uh, I'll try to send you some copy of it. Uh, in the Buddha's book, I think Bhikkhu Bodhi compiled 
quite a good um, articles about, you know, from the suttas. One part of it is like, you know, for even for lay people and monks, if you enjoy, it's okay. But we must have this kind of elements in our mind yeah, that uh, what are the consequences of enjoying? Say, uh, you no, know, uh, loving good food, you know, is good. You enjoy it. But you must also understand yeah, if I'm sick or I have no teeth already yeah, in the future and I'm old, can you even eat because I have mouth cancer? There will be suffering, right? Because I cannot enjoy my food anymore. So you must know the consequences if you have this kind of craving towards food. You still enjoy it by having this kind of understanding in your mind. Yeah? That there will be consequences in the future if I if I keep on craving for the food. I'm not sure that it makes sense to you, Penny. The danger of it. Mm, I think um, it makes sense, but only I have a, a very uh, clear, not clear, very obvious uh, question in my mind. It's like, because I see when there is pain that we want to get rid renounce. Of we want to practice, oh, we want okay. to renounce. Okay. But what, what actually pulls me back, I see, is actually the pleasure, the joy. But then mm -hmm. one of the sutta, the Buddha also mentioned when we do good, one of the sutta, I forgot which one, then we enjoy the benefit of pleasure of five senses mm -hmm. in human realm or in the deva realm, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking like since I, I see that, personally think that, happiness this kind of pleasure of five senses uh, is like holding me back because you really it's like life sometimes you have some music you feel relaxed your body relax you know relax however however how can i in a way have a relaxed mind and body but it's like this pleasure uh doing charity gives me this enjoyment of human or deva pleasure right but did the, does it help me in, in, in walking the noble effort or, or attain Nibbana, something like that? You, you know what I mean? It's like, just like my aim is to attain Nibbana, to see the truth, right? So mm -hmm. the Buddha in the Sutta say you do good, you will enjoy five senses pleasure in this realm, right? Mm -hmm. This is mentioned in the Sutta. Yes, so yes. So how can I, how can I, like, how can I organize my thoughts is like I want to go Nirvana but I know this is happening so mm -hmm. what's my direction then okay am I, I too harsh with uh, myself or actually I'm asking a right question <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it is something very personal of course in the sutta you know the Buddha's giving his teaching to different levels of people some even some lay people they are married but they can uh, renounce themselves from sensual pressure. Not many people did that, but some who can really do that. You know, they have wives, they have children, but they are not attached to it. Like the Viva girl, this is Sukapana. If it's the if the story is telling the truth, lah. and we know people like Anatta Pinika or Sukapana, Bimisara or Sukapana when he passed away. Uh, Sukapana is already good enough, right? <laughs> Before you strive on to, for Arahanship. There are people who, as I said, still in their lay life and Sukapana, well, you still have greed. You still have greed, but your faith with Triple Gem is very strong, unshaken. Yeah? And you have the understanding about uh, this the self, so called self, is only five aggregates. You're not attaching that, you know, there is an eternal self. There's a self view, it's not there. Okay? And you still have anger, you still have greed, you still have some level of delusions, but you're already a sotapana. Yeah, It doesn't mean that you really have to suffer, don't enjoy, and right? then only become a sotapana. <laughs> uh, well, in this case, like the Buddha says, when you do charity, you enjoy the five uh, senses, pleasure in human realm or the mm -hmm. realm, right? Then, um, how do I say? Uh? Some 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 monk will tell us channel your 
your charity or your dana to Nibbana. Mm. So is it, but but it looks like the Buddha says it's like it's like that. It's like that. You know, the, the karma or the nature mm. works like that. You mm. do good, you enjoy fine. <laughs> But mm. that's the special. Yeah. So if I channel it, then what is this? Yeah, because does the Buddha also mention that when we do good, we channel it to Dimata instead of like let the nature work like that? Of course, ultimate, ultimately, of course, ultimately, liberation, you know, is the final one. That we hope that we will get there. Yeah. But if you are not there, what can we do? <laughs> The Buddha so did not end. Channel thing. Uh, also, Buddha yeah. mentioned is it to channel yes, yes, to yes, make definitely, exploration. Definitely, oh, yeah, okay. and especially, especially for the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis, uh, because the whole life, uh, like you see very clearly, right? Bhikkhus, bhikkhus, uh, yeah, and 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 you know they're already full time. You don't have to think other things already. You know, you have yeah. to channel everything, all your energy towards separation. But for lay people, okay, okay, you take your time, <laughs> and okay. if you are not there yet, yeah, okay, and you're trying to force yourself to be there, mm. it may create suffering to oneself. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, Thank so, you, Sister Yu. Uh, yeah, just like I mentioned, uh, the the bhikkhu body says, uh, when we enjoy, we must know what is the risk, the consequences, and the risk. It's not going to be permanent. This enjoyment. Because of uh, impermanence, I'm going yes. to die. I'm going to get sick. I won't get enjoyment anymore. So I must know uh, suffering is there, one. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not only yeah, happiness, yeah. not only enjoyment. So there is a risk, there's a danger. I think it's called danger. The there's danger. An attachment. Of, yeah, yes. Attachment. The danger of attached attach to sensual pleasure. You must know the risk. Yeah. And we also must understand there's a way. Yeah. For the liberation, there is a way for liberation. There is a noble path. Yeah? Okay, thank you, thank you, Sister Young, very much. Okay. So I, I think this part uh is is quite clear. Yeah, I think that uh you know the 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 key thing is the mind. Yeah, whatever suffering that you have, the key thing is the mind. If you can let go of the attachment, the desire, then you will not have the kind of suffering. Yeah. Uh, I just want to conclude yeah, with these two a few paragraphs from the Good article. Uh, I call it the learning principles uh, of the doctrine of the karma. After understanding the doctrine of karma, right? What are the learning points? Okay, uh, this is what Bhikkhu Bodhi is saying. You first have to understand the condition on which they depend, all this karma, yeah. According to the Buddha, whatever arises arises through appropriate causes and conditions. And this applies with equal force to suffering and happiness. Both suffering and happiness, they have their causes and conditions. We must ascertain the cause and the condition that lead to harm and suffering. And likewise, cause and condition that lead to well-being and happiness. At least from the last few sessions, we learned that yeah, the wholesome deeds and unwholesome deeds, yeah, these are the causes. And of course, in terms of the mental aspect, also mentioned in the, the wholesome and the unwholesome dips related to greed, hatred, and delusion. So these are the causes and conditions. Once we have extracted these two principles, the conditions leading to harm and suffering, and the other hand, conditions leading to well-being and happiness, so we have at our disposal an outline of the entire process that leads to our ultimate goal. Yeah, final liberation from suffering. So you have the very mundane kind of principles, and you also have the super mundane one, uh, especially if you remember about uh, not black and not white karma. Okay, without greed, hatred, and delusions. Yeah, those kind of karma that will bring you to liberation. So every action that we do. Yeah, we always check our mind. Is there any great hatred and delusion that bring it to um uh what do you call that? Uh, uh to global rims. You must be very careful. I told you that experience that uh, I, I feel saliva in my mouth as if I'm attached to the food. Uh, so the question is if I'm attaching to the food, 
that will be the consequences, right? Yeah. Spirit world or hell. No other places. So I have to be uh have the kind of understanding eh, with this uh the what the doctrine of karma. Next one. Some say uh, uh say some do not believe in rebirth in according with the karma. So this is what a uh, suggestion from Bhikkhu Bodhi. Eh? From experience in the present, I mean this present now, not past or future. So are these principles that we are observing eh, or if our understanding bring happiness or suffering? So is it beneficial or harmful for me and others now? Okay, Does it promote long-term welfare and happiness now? Not next line, but now. Yeah. So when this is seen, immediately visible harmful consequences to which unwholesome mental state read to become a sufficient reason for abandoning them and the visible benefits to which wholesome mental states leads become a sufficient motivation for cultivating them. Then, whether or not there is a life after death, one has adequate reasons in the present life to abandon unwholesome mental states and cultivate wholesome mental states. Okay? So if there's afterlife, sure, that everything fit, fit in already. Right? If there's no other life, we are still benefited. <laughs> okay, this is what uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi is you know, trying to say, right? So I hope uh, this last session on the topic of the karma, right? Yeah, will at least give us some benefits in our practice. Yeah, and especially when you want to share this kind of knowledge with our friends, family members. Okay. This hopefully this four session give you some idea how to deliver this kind of uh, doctrine to your friends, yeah, and family members. Now, any feedback from the floor? So, as a child, does it help you to understand better about the concept of karma? Yeah. Yes. How much better? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Um. I don't uh, know. I, I must say that uh, mm. I, my my knowledge for all this sutta is very very minimal. You ask me to read sutta is uh, it's actually very torturing to me to read because I won't understand a single thing. <laughs> so, um, so so when I actually sign up at that, I said, mm, karma not not too bad uh, The topic maybe can uh. understand a bit. <laughs> so I guess okay la, not, not too bad la. I mean I mean mm. with all the explanation is okay la. Okay. Yeah, uh, anyone else want to say anything? Easy, I know you only attended two lessons, <laughs> but uh, yeah, your understanding about karma is it better than before? Or still a lot of things to dig, you don't quite understand. I think whatever wholesome and wholesome thinking uh, that creates a happiness or suffering option, uh, there's one thing that should trigger into our mind. Um, personally for myself is um, what is the trigger that makes our mind suffering and what is the trigger that condition our mind to be happy? I think if we understand that, um, I also see how, um, you know, the stories of this uh, Kokoli who actually commits suicide, he has, she has a very big heart to help all those uh, uh, young singers to become successful to the extent that it, even detriment and it complains about the, the organizers' programs and detriments her help. So I guess that is where if if that craving didn't let go itself, when he thinks that she's helping a lot of people but at the same time, he actually harm herself. I think that's that is where the condition itself we we, we really need to real, mm -hmm. self realize it, which is not easy, of course. So mm. the self-realization is very important when we learn about this karma and rebirth. The, the minutes we can come up on the self-realization, I think that's the minutes that we are safe. Mm -hmm. It is um yeah, it is quite difficult for us to judge others, especially we are not that close to them. We can only see what is actually happening at the surface. Yeah. But judging a person is difficult. But through our own experience, uh, I think we will learn more. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Fanny or Sujen, anything else to add? 
my mind right is still a bit uh, at the question before I ask, but I'm looking at it right uh, from this. Uh, what influenced me is like, like I say, karma is always like everything to me, but now I know the anyama that actually uh, not all about karma. Other factors. So, yeah, there are other factors also. But somehow I still cannot understand the whole picture, see, like penetrate it, but I will keep it with me. Uh, but from the conclusion, I know that it's like abandoned, unwholesome, you know, actions or mental states and cultivate wholesome mental state is very important. So then purifying the mind is like, prompt me another question. This is like, many times I see I got many unwholesome mental states which uh, I cannot control. It just prompted out, you know. Maybe I'm not there yet, but um, I somehow if I don't want to go back to meta, or sometimes I'll just like apology or sometimes I'll, I'll name it as ill will, you know, ill will. Uh, sometimes I will just uh, repent. It's like, I'll say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, you know. Uh, somehow the fear is that I'm afraid I create unwholesome mental state. You know, because that is can be very ill will. So it probably like another questions when I have this thought in mind, unwillingly, um, unwillingly at my stage now because I cannot see my intention of the great hatred illusion is there. So it's just a fear, and of course I'm suffering because I know this ill will. What can you, what maybe you have something to say to help me, um, because I see that very frequent. Yeah, unwholesome state of mind. Yeah, so uh, I think in the suttas, uh, there are many methods to uh, to overcome these unwholesome mental states. Yeah, they are, you can try one by one. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to recall for the sutta. I think it's a sutta on the top, uh, Vipaka, if I'm trying to uh, recall it, right? Uh, of course, this is what mentioned in the sutta. You can try to stop it when it, you see it arises. Stop it and see which one works. And uh, the other one is like you, you have to use the antidote, like what Sujan mentioned just now. Looks like the meditation on that helps. But uh, I do agree, you know, that uh, you may have to use different methods in different occasions. I don't know. But I joined my car, you know, I created my, I invented my own method of trying to be mindful when driving, so I try to be innovative. You might find your own ways, uh, I wouldn't know. And yeah, and you have so deep into, you know, into uh, practicing the Dharma. Uh, I think having a, a, a close teacher is important. Yeah, because you can always relate to a teacher and the teacher knows your progress and can guide you, you know, uh, Accordingly, they will have more experience. So, but anyway, to find a teacher which you can click is also challenging. I know that. Yeah, but keep finding. Don't give up. Meantime, uh, if you can't find a teacher with you, uh, that is only my suggestion. We follow the sutta, or be trying to be innovative to find ways. Like I told you, why I did that when I'm drawing is. Uh, also, I, I learned from Ajahn Brahm and that he says that I, I think one of the incidents he mentioned that um, I cannot remember what he says today, but what I understand from his talk is if you're doing the same thing again and again and again, you may lose your mindfulness. Yeah. Sometimes you may have to do the reverse. <laughs> Say, you know, you brush your teeth, you brush on the left and right, you're very happy joy. But then that morning, I'm going to brush on my right to the left. It's very unhabitual, right? You don't feel comfortable to brush on the right. But at least you gain back your awareness that you're brushing your teeth. Yeah. I'm using this method to, to pause, like you know, instead of like, say, if you count your breath, one or two, you know, or aware of breath, but easily I lost my thought, you know, lost in the thought. So that's why I, I, I counted with my method, yeah. The three, three, two, two with a pause. Okay, every time in the pause, I check. Okay, I'm sitting, you know. And these are the scenery that I saw in my driving. And other people are trying to cut in. 
okay, I let them cut in. Then I come back to my bits again. And this is my way of trying to create a lot of awareness. You know? Instead of losing in my thought, then I'm driving. Not sure it makes sense to you or not. If you have mm, okay, I think uh you mentioned about those teachers, so but I'm very happy that um uh those uh you know teacher Wong's uh, teacher back to SJB again. Mm -hmm. I I go on every Thursday for the vipassana meditation. So I I will make aspiration uh, like you say. Well, maybe mm -hmm. the condition not ripen, but I I believe lah uh, because I I see changes lah. Uh, so I uh, continue to make aspiration to meet a close teacher again. You know. Uh, then maybe help me to overcome this ill will. So uh, something like that. Okay. I'm not sure whether Fine. if loving kindness help you or not. Mm. Uh, I'm help not sure. Yeah. yeah. So can get. Uh, I will try different method and different thing, different method, and see mm. which works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, okay. you're right. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have the kind of ability to see what is the method that best suited you. Oh, it's okay. For me, I'll just try. Yeah, I'll find a few. Uh, I personally will do a few practices which is suitable for me. Uh, but I know, yeah. I know, I uh, know, maybe I'll call you someday about this okay. uh, Singh Pusa because I, in one experience where I was very fear and I know I cannot do anything, you know, I might, uh, that, that, the fear of death is not so great la, because I know I might not die, la, okay. But mm -hmm. I know oh, I'm very fear. But I purposely, because I know if die, I need to do something. I purposely project a Kuan Yin Pusa in front of me. Uh -huh. uh, so, so, I cannot tell, uh, but I know it's my brother. So, I can accept that. But I just want to ask you, where am I going? <laughs> this question. Because today you mentioned about different land. Uh. So, <laughs> I also don't know where I'm going. Maybe I go river, 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 right? So, maybe another day I call you. Ask me something about oh, this. Okay. But I know I'm, not encu Pusat I'm not encouraging you to go uh, to go to a Dewa Riyam, la. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. la. But uh, what is mentioned in the Sutta that the uh, Buddha did not deny, you know, uh, with a good practice, you can be reborn in such uh, such Dewa Riyam or human race and enjoy your sense of pleasure. But of course, you must also aware there are risks or danger in. Uh, overwhelming with this sensual pressure. We must be. No, I, I'm not talking about sensual pleasure, Ram. I'm talking about the pure land. I, I don't have heart to go oh, pure land. land. Okay, pure uh, land. Like my brother, my aunties, my mom, they already decided they are going to pure land. I'm <laughs> not. But I know this uh, Kuan Sin Pusa, the compassion. I trust her. Mm. I trust her, you know. Okay. Uh, so uh, in my dead bed, like, I'm thinking if at that time my mindfulness is not strong enough. You know, mm. to view the pain, to experience, to understand the pain, the thoughts, you know. I might I might have projection of this uh this image of Kuan Yin in me. So where am I going? Mm -hmm. <laughs> My question is where am I going? <laughs> well, you have to ask yourself. Uh... I don't have answer yet. Huh? Okay, we will share later. We are discussing yeah, okay. personally. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh I think uh anyone else would like to say anything before we we do the share of merits? Yeah, just a short one. Okay. I think from the lessons learned from, from this module, mm -hmm. um, in the sutta, the Buddha actually said a lot about, you know, after upon dissolution of the body, uh, one could be reborn in the Wufu states. If mm -hmm. not, then in human, and one would suffer if we do unwholesome actions. And Conversely, if we perform a lot of wholesome deeds or we abstain from unwholesome actions, then upon dissolution of the body, uh, we may be reborn in Deva realm or human realm. So uh, I think when we just look at more emphasis on our karma rather than look at the vipaka, because if we just concentrate on vipaka, we have a lot of fear and uncertainty in our mm -hmm. mind. But once we are assured that you know, whatever actions we do are more wholesome, then let nature take its course. Of course, we continue to do aspiration. That gives us assurance that we are walking the right path. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ramon, do you have any comments? Sujia? 
So thank you for participating in this DIG course. <laughs> Thank you, Ayo. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>